All right, Revelation 10. Let's, uh, let's uncover the mystery, shall we? Um, I had to go back on Sermon Audio and, and find out where I left off back in the 90s when we were here last. Um, uh, Revelation chapter 10. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Uh, isn't that something that in a court of law, that's, that's where we get it from. That's where we get it from. Raise your hand to heaven. Why is that? Why is it that everybody, we have to raise your hand to heaven? But that is a, an accepted norm and has been in our country. Where did it come from? It came right out of the Bible. Um, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. We covered that. It doesn't mean that it's the end of time. It means everything that God has been waiting to do, he's going to do it now. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and this is, it has to be the last trump. We've already gone through uh, the, the first six trumpets in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets and so we've been kind of going through the scriptures starting in Matthew looking at what this what uh, this mystery encompasses is it something that can be known is it something that we can find out is it something that can be revealed to us or is it something only given to the hierarchy? Is it something only given to uh, the clergy, to the elite? Um, I remember years ago, uh, somebody sent me a, a Bible. And uh, I don't remember what translation it was. It's a pretty good sized Bible. But I noted that in the middle of it, it had um, the Apocrypha, which the, the Catholic Church includes as part of their canon of scripture. They believe that the Apocrypha came to them uh, f by inspiration of God. And I'd never looked at the Apocrypha before, never studied it, never uh, looked into it or anything like that. But I guess the Lord led me to this one page. And um, I don't remember uh, the exact specifics of it, but it sort of went along like this. It, 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 it involved the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah... Uh, was told by God to do this until so Jeremiah sent word out that he needs a certain number of scribes to come in because he's going to give them things from God and he wants them to write them all down. And so he brings in, I can't remember the number, it's quite a few, and all these scribes are coming in. And so he dictates to a certain number of these scribes certain words that he says are from God. And then he has a smaller group of scribes, and they're going to write out several uh, editions of, of this prophecy from God, and he dictate, dictates it to them. They write it down, and there's, a, like I say, it's like a few, a few scrolls worth of information. And then uh, Jeremiah said this, now to the, to the greater group of scribes, and what I dictated to you, you take that and go out and proclaim that to all the people. I want them all to know this. But then he took the lesser group of scribes and he said, what I have given you is only for those who are the elders or the, I think it was, had something to do with their worthiness to hear what God said. In other words, there was a whole collection of scrolls supposedly from God's mouth that are not for everybody to hear, only a select few. And when I read that, Mike, I went, that's, that's the Catholic Church. They claim that they have a group, uh, let me try to remember the name here, the Magisterium. There's a, a group of Catholic bishops and cardinals in the Vatican along with the Pope, they're called the Magisterium, and they, and they alone, are the final Word of God. Now, that may include a large portion of what's written in the Bible, but when it comes to other things that has been settled by 
church tradition over the years, the issue of purgatory, the issue of, uh, you, of the uh, transubstantiation of the Eucharist into the flesh, meat, and literal blood of Jesus Christ, uh, the doctrine of Mary being a co-redeemer and having a significant part in your salvation, that Mary is a mediator between us and Jesus Christ. All of those things that the Catholic Church has deviated from the Scriptures in, they deviate from them, but they believe they are still the collective Word of God because the magisterium said so. And you can say, well, I'm reading in the Bible, and the Bible says this. And those bishops and cardinals will say, we don't care. We don't care what the Bible says. We are the magisterium. We're the ones who tell you what to believe. And if you don't believe what we tell you to believe, then you will be excommunicated, and you will not have a chance to go to heaven. I don't like that. That sounds like the, the, the government that... The Democrat Party wants to build in this country by taking everybody's guns away from them so that only the, uh, only the elect, only the worthy people will have the guns. They will protect all of us. Do you believe that? Our founders didn't believe it. Uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chase a rabbit. Turn to um, 1 Samuel. 13, I believe. 1 Samuel 13. We've been in the book of Revelation since, what, 2015? Something like that. It's why it takes so long. Yeah. 1 Samuel 13. Look at verse 19. Let me see if I can put that on the screen for you. First Samuel 13, starting at verse 19. You start reading there while I'm... Uh, there we go. There was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. And, and what he's talking about is a blacksmith or coppersmith or any kind of, any kind of someone who worked in, in, in metal. Um, and the purpose was, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords and spears. Listen, our enemies do not want us armed. Um, I, I watched a documentary. Uh, I'm a, J.R. and I, we both have an interest in World War II. And, um, and I, I, never thought, I never thought I would see the protests that I'm seeing in America against the Jews. I never thought I'd see that. It is Nazi Germany, 1933, all over again. And... Um, but anyway, this documentary was based upon the Nuremberg Trials. Right after World War II, um, and Germany, you have to understand, Germany is destroyed. Um, um, Goebbels went out and made a speech because uh, the Russians had captured 300,000 German soldiers on the Eastern Front. They lured them into Stalingrad and then surrounded them and cut them off and killed a bunch of them, but they captured 300,000 German soldiers. And so now it's not looking good for, for, the, for Germany to win this war. They're fighting it on two fronts, and they never wanted to do that. So uh, Joseph Goebbels goes out, and he makes a speech, and he calls for what he calls total war. What he means by that is... They are going to arm every single German man that they can find, and in some cases women, and in some cases boys. They're going to arm them and use them as the, the great, they called it uh, the Volksturm. Volk means the people, and Goebbels added this word for storm on the end of it, thinking and he was, a, he, was a, um, he was a propaganda specialist. He used this term Volkssturm because he wanted it emphasized to the German people that once the German people took over this fight, they were going to storm the enemy and they were going to bring in the final victory for Germany. 
Well, it didn't work out that way. If you've got guys that don't know how to use guns and don't know how to fight warfare, you don't have soldiers. You've got cannon fodder. You've got guys that are on the front lines that are just there to get shot while the real soldiers on the, on the back are shooting bombs over and stuff like that. It didn't work out for them. But the idea, that what I'm trying to get across is, it was illegal other than that. It was illegal for anybody, especially a Jew, to own any kind of weapon. The Jews just didn't have it. And so when they come now to the Jews and bring them out of their houses, out of their apartments, and that they've destroyed their businesses, and they bring them out in the streets, and they say, get on the trains. We're taking you to a work location. We're going to put you to work. That was all a lie. The trains went to the concentration camps. They took the people off the trains, put them in the chambers, dropped the cyanide pellets, gassed hundreds of them at a time, brought them out, put more of them in and they had no ability whatsoever to stand up against, stand up for themselves because they could not fight the bullets that the German soldiers would have put into them. The, the only battle between the Jews and the German soldiers happened in Warsaw. The Jews in the ghettos, they were hearing that the trains were going to the concentration camps but coming back empty and getting more of them. And while some of the Jews were thinking, oh, they're just going to take us to put us to work. I mean, working is, and being fed is better than being killed. And the other guys were going, you don't understand. They're not taking you to work, and they're not going to feed you either. They're taking you to kill you. And so uh, a bunch of brave Jewish men and women, they started uh, raiding German soldiers as they walked by. They would knock them out. They would kill them. They would steal their guns. And when they finally got enough weaponry available to them, they launched this counterattack. Um, I forget, it had to, the Warsaw Ghetto or something like that is what it's called. But they launched this counterattack. They knew they were all going to get killed. But what they said was, uh, it's better to die fighting than to die just laying down. We're not going to do it. Amen to that. And I'm telling you, your enemy both in this physical realm and in the spiritual realm, does not want you armed. The Bible says, arm yourself likewise. Arm yourself. God is telling you, get your sword out. Sharpen it. Get it ready. And so anyway, uh, verse 20, but the Israelites had to go down to the Philistines, went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, which is a plow share, his coulter, and his axe, and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes to sharpen the goads. So what you've got is you've got well-trained Philistine soldiers with spears, swords, shields, everything else, and you've got Jews with pitchforks. Who's going to win that battle? Philistines are. Every single time they're going to win that. Verse 22, it tells you what the thinking was on the part of the Philistines. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and Jonathan, his son was there found. So let me tell you what that is. The government can have weapons. The people can't. And let me apply that in a church setting. Uh, some of you have heard me say this before over the years, and I'm going to say it again to those who uh, have not heard me say this. You have as much right sitting in that pew to read and study your Bible and to hear from God as I or any other preacher does. In fact, if you don't, you'll make a poor church member. You will. Your preacher will preach something and you'll buck against it. He's going to preach that because he's been in the Word of God. He's been studying. He's been reading. He's been praying. He's been meditating. He has been desperately trying to hear from God so that he can give to his people. 
And this happens over and over. Mike, I, I know some of the things that's happened to you in your ministry over the years. Uh, I know what I've encountered over the years. And I can tell you, you preach the Word of God and you preach the things of the Word of God. And you've got people who think they know better and they're going to buck against you every time. They're going to amen you in the pew. When they get out in the car, they're going to say, that was the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. They'll run the preacher down, they'll run his sermons down, and uh, they're like little Judases sitting in the pews, just waiting to hear, uh, what was it, some guy told you that um, he just couldn't listen to you because you didn't have a degree? I almost have a degree. Huh? Yeah, I got about 104 right here. Um, I just, I just didn't, I didn't, I, I got married third year, you know, after three years in Bible college, and um, God used my wife to talk me out of going back. He used her. She hardened her heart, and she said, I'm not going. What? And, uh, but she was right. She was right. I'm glad I did not go back. I would not have gotten I would have relied upon that education rather than relying upon the Word of God. And um, so I'm saying to all of you and all of you online, arm yourself. Read your Bible. Don't let any religion, any pastor, any Facebook post, don't let anybody tell you that you can't understand the Bible because you don't have an education. Brother Sterling, he would be here today uh, if him and Gloria and Monica hadn't been so sick. But that man had an eighth grade education. And he probably knows about as much of the Bible as anybody here. I know he reads it. And when he doesn't read it, when he gets out in his truck and you turn his truck on, he's got Alexander Scurby in the CD player playing King James Bible reading. Amen. So anyway, back, back to um, this. Uh, the mystery, we're not to be ignorant of this mystery. You can know it, you can know it just as well as I know it, and uh, nobody, no earthly institution, nobody in this world has exclusive rights to the mysteries of God and you have to get it from them. You can get it directly from the Word of God. Now, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 15. This is what I mentioned we were going to... The Sunday school lesson is beginning now. The official one. 1 Corinthians 15. This is part of the mystery. Remember, um, when we were in Romans looking at this, uh, Paul said, I would not have you ignorant... Uh, of this mystery that blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I believe the fullness of the Gentiles coming in is this right here in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 50, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, it, that's not funny. No, it ain't. You ain't got to be anywhere in a hurry this afternoon, do you? God. I'm not going to take up too much time. Behold, I show you a mystery, verse 51. We shall not all say, here's part of it right here. This is the fullness of the Gentiles, I believe. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in, a, in the twinkling of an eye at the, at the last trump. Now that matches what we just saw Back here in Revelation 10. The seventh trumpet. The last trumpet. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel. When he shall begin to sound. The mystery of God should be finished. And so you add that to Romans 11. You add that to Romans 16. You add that to Romans, 1 Corinthians 15. Behold I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And, uh, and very quickly, I'm going to add to that Ephesians 5. Turn there very quickly, and you can make a little note here that this, I think this is linked, well, obviously it is, by, by way of the revelation of the mystery. Ephesians 5 talks about the roles of the wife and the husband. And uh, in verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. See, he's quoting now Genesis 2. He's quoting what Adam said. This shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. Adam said, cleave unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. Uh, I like Mike, Mike and Brenda Hutzel. I like them. Because when it's Mike, it's Brenda. They're together, always. And that's what God worked out for me and Lisa. When you started, uh, was preaching revivals, and you were giving guys that book I wrote on numbers, I was following you all over the country. But at that time, God had laid it on my wife's heart and my heart. She was to quit her well-paying job, come here to be with me. And when we started traveling, the whole family, all of us went everywhere. I drug my kids all over this country, made them go. But those were great times that we had as family. We did it together. And that's generally a rule. If I like this conference that I, I just came back from, they didn't invite my wife, but they knew she's coming. And because uh, if I go, she goes. We're one body, one flesh. And it's supposed to be that way in a church, too. The, the, the pastor is the husband, technically. The church is his wife. He's to treat his church like he treats his wife. And uh, when I speak of what God, when people come to me and they say, Pastor Mike, we, we love you so much, we appreciate what you've done, I include the church in on that. This is our ministry. This is not just mine. This is us together, what God has done with all of us. Can I say, hear you say amen. The two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So you add that in 1 Corinthians 15. That mystery is when that trumpet sounds, and we are called up, both the dead in Christ and us, when we're called up to meet Jesus in the air, marriage day. Now we are his body, his flesh, and his bones. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it, God. Open our eyes. And Father, in these days, dark days that we're living in, I pray, dear God, that each and every person listening to my voice today uh, has the light of your word shining in them as a lamp to their feet and a light unto their path. Father, I'm just the mouth that speaks this book. It's your word in their life that counts. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless it this morning. Bless Brother Mike and Sister Brenda. I thank you for them, God, and their friendship. Bless them, Lord, as they minister here, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen.